evening. Before we start, we would like to recognize that we respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home of the Oroham and Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationship with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education, offerings, partnerships, and community service. Welcome everyone, my name is Jessica Rettis. I'm a professor in the School of Journalism and director of our brand new master's in bilingual journalism. Uh, I'm proud to mention that my research on bilingual journalism in the United States uh, was recently awarded the Center for University Education Scholarships, as we call CUES here at the University of Arizona. Uh, so we can advance on the research of bilingual journalism in the country. I would like to remind all attendees that we have access to simultaneous interpretation to Spanish. On your screen, you can see the option, click the interpretation and select the language channel. Also, if you, if you would like to ask questions to any of our presenters, panel and panelists, please use the QA option and we will read your questions in order of appearance. The session will be recorded for educational purposes. In 2021, the University of Arizona welcomed the first cohort of students for the Masters in Bilingual Journalism, a cutting edge program that offers professional and academic training for students who want to report about and or for Latinx communities in the United States and abroad. It is one of the only fully bilingual programs in the country. For those uh, who are interested in supporting our, our new bilingual program, we are gonna be sharing the link uh, so you can check our uh, program. This bilingual journalism degree advances the, universities of, the University of Arizona's strategic goal to strengthen programs that invest in Hispanic students, which is why I'm honored to introduce an outstanding Latina leader in our university and in our community, Dr. Marla Franco, Assistant Vice Provost for Hispanic Service Institution. Uh, serving institution initiatives, HSI, as we call it here, and, and in nationally, uh, who led efforts that resulted in the U of A to becoming the first four-year public university in the state of Arizona to be federally recognized as a Hispanic service institution by the U.S. Department of Education in April uh, 18, right, Dr. Franco? The floor is yours, the screen is yours. <laughs> Good morning, buenos dias. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rites, for your incredible leadership in, in bringing today's webinar together. Really, as I think about what makes the University of Arizona a vibrant, invested, and forward-thinking Hispanic-serving institution, it's passionate faculty like you, and it's programs like bilingual journalism that keep us rooted in people and place and takes this work to a whole nother level. We are so grateful to have the support as well of our university president, Dr. Robert Robbins, who has really been a steadfast champion of HSI initiatives since its inception. His encouragement and support enables us to be quite visionary as an HSI. Dr. Robbins, thank you so much for being here to help us kick off this morning's webinar. Dr. Robbins, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Buenos dias and mucho gracias, uh, Dr. Franco, for the kind introduction and including me in this exciting and important discussion today. <clears throat> and I would also like to extend my uh, incredible uh, thanks and gratitude to Dr. Uh, Jessica Ritas uh, for organizing such an amazing lineup of speakers today and for your leadership in launching our master's program in bilingual journalism. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to Congressman Joaquin Castro, and thank you, uh, Congressman Castro, for bringing attention to this important topic. Since becoming a Hispanic serving institution in 2018, we have come to realize that a commitment to this designation far exceeds simply enrolling Hispanic students. It's also about offering degree programs that provide opportunities for all students to experience bilingual and bicultural learning opportunities, especially given, given our location in the United States uh, on the Mexican borderlands. Diversifying the workforce is an important part of the work to create more inclusive and just societies, 
particularly in industries where professions, professionals have a public voice. That's why I'm so proud to know we have a signature degree programs like the one uh, that we'll be discussing today that can help create job opportunities and access for our Hispanic and Latinx students. Now on that note, I'd like uh, to transition to the Honorable uh, Joaquin Castro, who represents Texas 20th Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. Along with the Congressional Compa Hispanic Caucus and the Committee on Oversight, Congressman Castro requested that the Government Accountability Office investigate and report on the representation of Latinx in the, in the, the media. Welcome, Congressman Castro. We look forward to hearing your thoughts about this report. And again, thank you so much for being with us here today. Well, thank you, Dr. Robbins, and thank you to Dr. Marla Franco also, and of course to uh, Jessica Retis for convening us to discuss this very important issue. And it speaks volumes that the administration and the president of University of Arizona is part of this webinar. Thank you, President. We appreciate that very much. Uh, we have as a community a very fundamental problem. Uh, we have over the years been left out of the telling of the American story and the American narrative. And that's not just a culturally inconvenient thing, uh, it's, it is dangerous to the Latino community across the United States. And I'll give some context as to why I say that. And then also, uh, I hope you have access to the GAO report that we commissioned and received a few months back. There is a second installment that's gonna come in the spring that will be even more detailed. Uh, but I'll go over uh, just briefly some of the numbers on that as well. But first, I wanna give you some context as to why I, as a member of Congress representing my great town of San Antonio, Texas, decided about three years ago to really take this on as an issue, uh, diversifying the media across the United States, whether it's hard news or Hollywood and entertainment, social media, publishing, for example. Uh, the media industry, and I'm gonna put, I know media is plural, but I'm gonna put it together as an institution. The media as an institution is still the main image defining and narrative creating institution in the United States. And I believe arguably, arguably American media is uh, perhaps the most image defining and narrative creating institution in the world. And there's a reason that that matters to the Latino community. And there's probably no better way that I could say it than to offer you a brief vignette of an experience that I had and other members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus had uh, during the time that I was chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus from January of 2019 to January of 2021. Again, I had made the decision that this was one of the initiatives that we would take on. And so we began meetings with uh, media companies and hard news like CBS News, Comcast, NBC Universal, uh, the entertainment industry in Hollywood. Uh, so uh, as Ben Lopez knows and others who work uh, over in Los Angeles, we met with about six or seven different studios uh, Latinos, Latinas in the entertainment industry, directors, producers, so forth. Also the publishing houses, uh, Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, uh, Magazine Publishing. We met with Meredith and Condé Nast and Hearst, uh, newspapers, Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and others as well. So there was an experience I'll never forget in May of 2020. Uh, we had convened a meeting with the Association of American Publishers. And this is an organization that represents the largest American book publishers in the United States. It was supposed to be a meeting in March of 2020, but because of the pandemic, as you know, their in-person meeting got put off and this ended up being a Zoom meeting in May of 2020. There were about 20 or 30 of us on the call and including some of the CEOs of the largest publishing companies in the United States. And I asked uh, one of the CEOs at one point, Something I didn't think would end up being a trick question. I asked him a very basic question, whether he could name three Latinos or Latinas who had had a significant impact in American history. Uh, this was a very accomplished man, probably in his 50s, CEO of a major American company that not only publishes fiction and nonfiction books, but also textbooks for schools and universities. And so uh, he thought about my question for five or 10 seconds. And then he finally said, um, yeah, no, I, I, I can't. Uh, and he wasn't trying to be rude to me. He wasn't blowing me off. His was an earnest answer that he could not think of three Latinos or Latinas who were essentially historical figures in American history. And 
as I thought about that, my first reaction was to be upset with him in particular. But as I thought about it longer, I thought about the fact that it's really a systemic problem. Uh, this man was from, it was, was from the West Coast originally and had an upbringing where he wasn't around a lot of Latinos and wouldn't necessarily know some of the history and stories. Uh, but it really brought home this idea and the fact that the Latino narrative over the generations in America has been left out of the telling of the larger American narrative. In other words, we're not really in history books. Uh, I can count probably on one hand when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s in school, the number of Latinos or Latinas who were in American or Texas history books. Uh, and so we're not in history books. And we're, we've often been left out of, particularly in a positive way, retellings in American media, whether it's in hard news or particularly in Hollywood. And so what happens then because your story and your positive contributions as a people to a country where you make up almost 20% of the population, what happens is that there is a void in narrative and that void in narrative gets filled by dangerous stereotypes. So Latinos as drug dealers, Latinos as illegal invaders, uh, Latinas as hypersexualized in television and on film. And when you do this decade after decade after decade through generations, the effect is a stain on a community and a group of people that takes, I think, a long time to turn around. And so the last three years for me, and I know for a lot of people on this Zoom call, the last many, longer, many years of their lives have been dedicated to really turning that ship around, talking about the positive contributions of Latinos and Latinas, and also trying to change the way uh, this community is seen and filling in that void in narrative uh, not only in American history textbooks and Texas history and other state histories, but also in American media. And, but what I also experienced during that time and when I really put my foot on the gas on this, we start, again, I started in January of 2019, when I really put my foot on the gas was after what happened in El Paso, Texas in August of 2019, where you had a madman who drove 10 hours and killed 23 people because he considered them, quote unquote, Hispanic invaders to Texas. And I thought about how somebody gets that idea uh, of Hispanic invasion, where that comes from. Part of it obviously was a political rhetoric of the time uh, that a lot of that's still going on, but the political rhetoric, uh, but also generations of stereotyping people and not fully accepting them as American and not telling their story and the stories and the writings of American history. And so that is a very dangerous nexus, a very dangerous combination between the stereotypes that come out of American media and the heated political rhetoric uh, that we've been living through, particularly in the last five or six years. Uh, and it makes it dangerous for a community when you get that combust combustible mix. Uh, I would also point out that I believe other communities, uh, whether it's Muslim Americans or as we saw with the wave of hate crimes, uh, particularly over the last year against Asian Americans, other communities have experienced and are experiencing uh, similar things. Uh, so this is something that's pertinent to the Latino community, but I think also pertinent to other American communities as well. Uh, and so, you know, I, we identified a, a problem, obviously, and we went about trying to systematically tackle it, right? This isn't something that you can solve in one meeting with one company, um, or even I think over the course of a year or two. Uh, this is something that is a sustained challenge and requires a sustained systemic effort to try to change. And the first part that we saw with, with many media companies uh, is transparency, is to show us your numbers. Uh, the reason that matters is, I think, part of the reason that you get stereotypes is because of, there's a lack of Latinos and Latinas who are in the storytelling roles. Let me take hard news, for example. Uh, the Los Angeles Times, when we met with them in... 2020 was only about 13% Latino in a, in a city that is between 40 and 50% Latino. The Washington Post, the nation's paper of record along with the New York Times right now, I think is only about 5% Latino. Uh, the, associate, the San Antonio uh, Hispanic journalists commissioned a report that showed, for example, in terms of local television in a city that was 64% Latino, only 25% of the anchors were Latino or Latina. And so the personnel that you have in your institution 
matters. The people who are making decisions about which stories are put on air, the editors that are that are making edits and offering suggestions and corrections to how somebody is described or to which storylines are put into a story, all of that matters in the final product. Uh, the same thing with Hollywood. Uh, it matters who the people are that can greenlight stories. It matters who the people are in the room that can say yes to a pitch. Uh, it matters uh, who the who the showrunners are, who the showrunners are, and who the who the script writers are that are attributing certain characteristics or certain lines uh, and certain characteristics and stories to Latinos and Latinas. So all of those things together make a huge difference in how a community is written about, spoken about, and ultimately perceived by the larger American society. But mind you, I would argue also how our own kids, our young boys and girls, how they perceive themselves. Uh, I would ask you all, if you haven't, to go back and look at an interview from the early 1970s. Uh, you spoke earlier about the uh, University of Arizona being on Native American land. In the early 1970s, uh, those of you that were around at that time, I wasn't born until 1974, but you may recall that uh, Marlon Brando won an Oscar for uh, his portrayal of, of Don Corleone in The Godfather, and uh, he refused the Oscar in 1973, and he sent a Native American woman uh, to be present for that ceremony. And he was asked about it on a very popular show later in the year, The Dick Cavett Show, in late 1973, why he did that. And he spoke about Hollywood's treatment of Native Americans at the time. And the fact, posing the question about the effect of young Native boys and girls always seeing themselves as the, as the bad guys in the country, in the Western movies and TV shows of the time. And psychologically, what that does to a group of people who always see themselves uh, as the bandit, as the robber, uh, as you know, I would argue it going through from then to now, uh, as the invader, as the drug dealer, as the criminal, all of those things have an effect on a community psyche, how they see themselves, how they see their potential, and how they see their future, and what they think their country believes about them. So the people that can help change that are the Latinos and Latinas who are in newsrooms, who are in Hollywood, who are, who are helping run social media companies to root out disinformation because you know, the GAO didn't get into that, but disinformation about our community, uh, particularly disinformation in Spanish, uh, has become a very big deal over the last few years and is accelerating in intensity. So the personnel makes a difference. So transparency is first. Once you have transparency, and we don't have transparency from everyone. Uh, for example, uh, I think Amazon Studios still has not put out their numbers uh, on Latinos and Latinas uh, at their company uh, in terms of, and also in terms of their content. Uh, they're up for a merger right now with MGM. Uh, SAG-AFTRA, which is otherwise a great deal, but when we first went to Hollywood in 2020, SAG-AFTRA didn't keep track of or obviously put out information about their membership. In other words, how many African-Americans, how many Asian-Americans, how many Latinos, Latinas are, are make up the SAG-AFTRA membership. So there is a baseline of transparency that's required in order to really make change. The second part of that change is accountability. And I think that's where all of us come in is uh, whether it's the Latino group at the LA Times or the Washington Post or the, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and others who are holding new newspapers and television and so forth accountable for making sure that it's representative of the communities they serve. Um, and so that's the second part on accountability is what we've been working on. We're still working on transparency issues with some, but the Congressional Hispanic Caucus has been able to get to that second part of accountability. So that's where the GAO report is really important because it allows us to really press on accountability. Uh, the Government Accountability Office writes all kinds of reports on many different subjects. And it's one of the main government organizations that provides legislators uh, with factual information that's supposed to help them make legislative decisions going forward. And so here, the GAO, just to go through these, I'm gonna read through it real quick. Uh, the Government Accountability Report, and you also take a look at it uh, if you haven't, found that the media industry uh, is, uh, now this is total jobs. This isn't just, for example, reporters, anchors. This is also uh, frontline staff, administrative staff, everything. Everybody that works in media companies. 
is about 12% Latino. Again, the population is about 18.5. And that was among the lowest of industries. The other industries combined, Latinos were about 18%. And the worst offenders in the industry were the publishing houses, which had among the lowest numbers. So, so Latinos make up well, about 18% of the newspaper, periodical, book, and directi directory publishers workforce. So it included newspapers also. In other words, that's where we had the greatest challenge. Service jobs have had the largest percentage of, of Latinos uh, making up 22% of workers. And management, so our, where we are in com media companies, we were concentrated in service jobs and management had the lowest numbers with about 4%. Latino representation. So I would say to all of us, that's not a big surprise, but I think this was an important, this was an important report because it's geared towards people who are making legislation and who are making decisions from the dais on these issues. Uh, it also said that Latino representation in various job categories remained relatively unchanged in the media industry from 2014 to 2018, uh, except for the service worker category in which the percentage of Latino workers increased six percentage points. Um, and then also went into some of the demographics, because obviously our community, you have Mexican-Americans, Dominican-Americans, Puerto Ricans, and so forth. We have a very diverse community. But I would encourage you to take a look at that report and think about its significance. And then I know that we wanted to leave a few minutes for questions. Hopefully, I haven't run over my time. Um, but I'll, I'll leave you with this. The reason that it's also important for legislators, and part of the reason that I jumped into this, aside from what I've described to you, is because this is an industry that receives a lot of tax breaks from the American people, including from in areas that are heavily Latino. Uh, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. And I'm gonna take the example of Netflix, uh, nothing against Netflix in particular, but Netflix has a big operation in New Mexico. New Mexico is 43% uh, Latino. And you know, whether it's the GAO report or studies by Ana Cristina Ramon at UCLA uh, or by the Annenberg Center for Inclusion have shown that Latinos in Hollywood make up usually less than 5% of roles, not only in front of the camera, actresses, actors, so forth, but also behind the camera. And so if you're a legislator in a state that has a population that's 43% Latino, and you're trying to make a decision about which industries you're gonna offer tax credits or tax breaks to, and you've got a group of people that are only getting, let's say 5% of the, of the work in front of and behind the camera. As a legislator, how is that a good bet on an industry that's not employing this vast group of people uh, who make up your population? And so I think that the industry really is running on borrowed time in being able to convince state legislators that it can be both exclusive of a large group of people and still get those people to subsidize their own exclusion because that's what we're doing right now. We're subsidizing our own exclusion. Uh, and so we've been working with, uh, Ken with Kenneth Romero over at the National Hispanic State Legislator Group uh, and other state legislators. Wendy Carillo in California, for example, has done wonderful work. Uh, she recently had uh, diversity and inclusion language in their major reauthorization of tax credits there. So working with state legislators to really start to, to press the industry on change, uh, on, on making sure that they're including folks, uh, including Latinos and Latinas, uh, and not leaving out a group of people that has been invisible and that makes up almost 20% of the country. So uh, with that, y'all, I'll be glad to take any questions, assuming that we still, I haven't run out of my time and we still have time for some. Thank you so much, Congressman. Yeah, we have a lot of questions. So Dr. Uh, Marla, Franco, and myself, we're gonna read the uh, questions. Uh, Dr. Franco, you wanna start, please? Yeah, there. that was amazing, Congressman Castro. So thank you so much. We actually have a number of questions. We certainly won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but, uh, you know, someone says, you know, things have not fundamentally changed for the Latinx community in mainstream media, especially Hollywood. So what comes next? And, and maybe, you know, what, uh, what has this report done in particular to really um, amp up kind of the, the legislative opportunity? 
So let me give you a very direct example today on uh, how we how this GAO report was helpful for me and for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus within Congress. Uh, today, the House of Representatives uh, in, in the next few hours is actually voting on the Competes Act. And one of the provisions in the Competes Act has to do with apprenticeships. So I have made the case over the last few years and the report, the numbers in this report were helpful in, in getting apprenticeships in media and entertainment included in the, in the list of industries that the federal government, the Department of Labor can go out and work with industry to, to increase the number of apprenticeships in that industry. Because we always hear, and I'm sure Ben, you hear it all the time, uh, when you press Hollywood about the numbers, their first reaction is to say, well, we're gonna we need to create a pipeline. Well, there will be, I think over the next five years, there's gonna be about $5 billion for industry if we can get the Competes Act, not only through the House and the Senate and into the, to the president's desk, there'll be about $5 billion for different industries. And if my amendment is successful this afternoon, that will include the media and entertainment industry to then go work with the Department of Labor to set up the infrastructure for these apprenticeships. So that's a very direct example on how this has been helpful and also how Congress can be helpful to the industry in getting this work done. Um, uh, now, you know, the, the default answer is often about the pipeline and, and it's true. We need to continue building a robust pipeline, but I would argue there's a secondary and, and equally important thing that people are sometimes not seeing the executives. Uh, there are already a lot of qualified Latinos and Latinas who are who could be screenwriters, uh, showrunners, uh, directors, writers, so forth, executives uh, who already have the credentials and the experience to do it. They are just not the ones being hired. So you're talking about two separate problems here, right? When you say let's build a pipeline, you're talking you're essentially saying, hey, let's start over and 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 help credential people, right? Um, well, you've already got people that are credentialed. They're just not the people you're picking to hire. And there's a difference in those two problems. And I think together, we need to press the industry on that second problem, that second issue. Uh, and so, so I, I give you an example of how Congress can be helpful and how this is important. Uh, the other thing is, y'all, it's helped me build a coalition within Congress and with state legislators now uh, on this issue. Because really, as you all know, you've done this work, you don't have that many elected officials over the years that are really pounding the industry uh, and trying to hold them accountable. Uh, part of the reason for that, and, and I'll, I mean, this is my 19th year in public service, and I'll tell you honestly, every time I thought about doing, uh, taking on this issue, there always seemed to be something more immediate for our community, whether it was uh, the, 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 you know, everything going on at the border, on immigration and kids being separated from their families, uh, or uh, healthcare, and you know, I've got a, I represent a district in San Antonio that is very much a working class bread and butter district. You know, and so there, there, there are other incredible issues to work on. And sometimes I think this one has been put to the side because of that. But again, this is a foundational issue for our community. It's not just culturally inconvenient or it's not just a matter of, well, you know, I really, I really wish this actor would get this role or something. This is foundational in terms of how a community is seen and whether it's seen at all. Thank you so much. I think this next question, you know, how do you propose starting the conversation in a professional setting? Um, the person says, you know, they work in local news and they've subtly tried to bring up the importance of journalists representing the community that they work for. Um, you know, they're one of few in the newsroom and even fewer on the air. So, you know, it's been overlooked in the past, despite their concerns being voiced. You know, do you have any tips on how to approach these conversations? Well, you know, the folks at the National Association of Hispanic Journalists are probably better qualified than I am because they've worked in newsrooms, whether it's in print or television, to give advice about how to talk to folks and, and supervisors in that industry. Uh, but I would say, just speaking as somebody, obviously, that's in a workplace and uh, works around people every day, I would say the best way to do it is probably to first approach the, the person or people you trust in an organization and express your concerns. Uh, hopefully you have a good relationship uh, if you're at a newspaper uh, with the senior editors, for example, or if you're at a television station with the managing director there, uh, but expressing it to people that you trust and also trying to build coalitions of people 
at your place of employment who care about the issue also, because it's likely that you're not alone in your concerns. You know, part of the part of the the, the challenge is that sometimes uh, we keep things to ourselves for fear of retribution, uh, but there are other people out there who work among us who have the same concerns. Um, and when you have a chance, for example, you should take a look at what happened in San Antonio with Isis Romero, who was an anchor at KSAT 12 News, who's an ABC affiliate, uh, and what she went through uh, and very bravely took on the system there. Uh, and also, you know, generally, the Hispanic Journalist Report, I think, uh, has helped make progress slowly, but I think it's helping make, make progress in San Antonio. So I mean to say that your efforts uh, are not wasted. I think your efforts will be helpful in changing the industry. Um, I, I, I'm going to, to read um, two questions from two outstanding Latino journalists, uh, Franz Sotomayor and Marilena Salinas, they are here with us. Uh, they're both very active and outstanding um, journalists um, and award winners. Um, Frank is asking, um, um, thank you, Congressman Castro. What is the next steps for following up on the GAO report? Uh, for example, is the Hispanic Caucus active on this media issue? And uh, Marilena Salinas is um, asking, Mr. Castro, can you expand on the impact of the lack of accurate coverage of the Latino community in mainstream media, mainly television news? Well, sure. I, I mean, I think, let me start with the last part of that. So the stereotypes are very damaging. When a community is reduced to a few stereotypes, it affects how the larger American society sees you what they think of your potential, which roles in society they think you belong in or which roles you can play. But again, the damage goes beyond how other people see you. I really believe that the damage is also internal. It, it, it affects how a community sees itself. And that's especially damaging for children, I think, as they think about uh, their role and where they fit into American society. Um, so yeah, I, more, more coverage with more people who understand the community that are told through the eyes and more people that understand the community that is more reflective of the whole of the community. Uh, look, of course there are bad things that go on in the Latino, Latino community, right? You know, as I told some of the folks at, in Hollywood, it's not like you're never gonna see another Latino drug de dealer on television. I mean, but for God's sake, you know, you know do, do we re really need like five nautical shows that define the community? And then, you know, it seems like all our other shows get canceled after one season, you know? So there's a lot of remedial work to do there. And then on the CHC issue, uh, the CHC is increasing and will increase in the coming years. It's, it's attention on this issue. So just, in fact, just last night, we were on the call for about two hours, about seven of us. Uh, Dr. Raul Reese from California is the chair of the CHC now. We only do two year terms. So he's the chair now. And we have just gone through a whole strategic planning for the last few months about our future. And one of the initiatives uh, that we're really going to be uh, working on, or I guess putting in a more prominent place in terms of our work is DEI work. So not just in the media industry, but really this is a problem across industries. The reason that I've been pushing it in the media industry is because yes, there's a lot of Latinos and Latinas in engineering, but engineers don't, don't define what people think about us and how we see ourselves in the same way that people in media do, right? But so, yes, this, has had a, this work has had a direct impact in how CHC thinks about what it should take on. Uh, we're gonna be more active. And then finally, on this point, I, even though I'm not chair anymore, uh, as some of y'all know, I've continued in earnest on this work. Um, we had a, I had a meeting in Washington last week with, there, there are two major mergers that are proposed right now the uh, at and is trying to sell off Warner to Discovery for about 43, it's about a $43 billion deal. It's mostly entertainment uh, properties, but it also includes CNN. Uh, and then Amazon is trying to purchase MGM Studios. So I had a meeting in Washington last week with David Zaslov, who's the CEO of Discovery, uh, along with, I don't know, Brenda's here, Brenda Castillo and uh, a few others, uh, uh, Janet Mugia from Unidos. Um, yeah, so we're continuing to press uh, to make sure that, that they basically are attuned to this issue. Uh, I met last week with the CEO of Penguin Random House, who they're trying to, to 
by Simon and Schuster. It's about a two or three billion dollar deal. Again, pressing them on this issue is that I actually need y'all's help because I told them I wanted to convene a roundtable uh, for the CEO to talk to Latinos and Latinas who have had problems getting books published because that industry has also been culturally exclusive. Uh, just you know, just as uh, the New Yorker and other magazines have been culturally exclusive. They're engaging in cultural exclusion of the Latino community. Uh, and then I've got a meeting with Amazon, uh, the head of Amazon, I think, uh, in March, in early March. Yeah, so I'm continuing on a weekly basis to do this work. Any other questions, y'all? I think I've run out of my time, so I don't want to eat into other people's time. <laughs> we have so many questions. I want to let Dr. Uh, Franco read the last the, the last two questions, for example, and then uh, we we will go to our, our panel. Yes. Um, oh my goodness, so many great questions uh, coming in. But I think you know some of the folks um, have a, a few common questions uh, just around the portrayal of undocumented uh, immigrants as invaders in political ads with local news stations. You know, what are maybe some thoughts around mitigating um, some of those narratives? But that's a great point. Um, I think they need to be called out for accepting money to put out false information. Um, you know, before the shooting happened in El Paso in early August of 2019, uh, then President Trump's campaign had run 2,000 Facebook ads talking about immigrant invaders to the United States. You see politicians in Texas and other places who are running for state office who are openly using that language now uh, of invasion. And they're often talking about brown immigrants or brown folks as invaders. And so you raise a great question, what responsibility do those companies have to not run those ads and not accept that money? Uh, and also, but also what is our initiative to call them out on it? Uh, because y'all know if we don't say anything, then they're going to keep taking the money uh, and running it. Um, and so I, I think it's a great point. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your time and, and most importantly, your contribution to really uh, putting pressure on this work and your engagement in the GAO report. Thank you for your engagement, your steadfast commitment to this work. Uh, we look forward to following your work and also engaging the leaders here with continued conversation and continued action. So thank you for joining us this morning. We, we really look forward to connecting with you at a later point in time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you all. Thank you all for putting this on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Uh, as we learned uh, in this report, it uh, brings clarity to the perpetual absence of Latinos in major newsrooms, film production, and other media industries, where the portrayals of lack of thereof uh, can seriously affect on how their fellow Americans view them. To discuss about the challenges, but also the opportunities we have in the near future, we invited representatives from uh, national U.S. Latino professional organizations, we have with us Arelis Hernandez, a Texas-based national correspondent for the Washington Post, covering the U.S.-Mexico border and immigration. She has dedicated herself to helping hold open doors for young people in the industry. And she's currently serving as the vice president of print for the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. We also have with us Benjamin Lopez, executive director of the National Association of Latino Independent Producers, NALIP. He serves as the year-round industry liaison for executives and content creators in the Latino Lens Incubator programs, working with the top agencies in the world to create and match these creators with the key industry professionals who can move their careers forward. We also have with us uh, Martin Rivera. He is a Boricua from Juncos, Puerto Rico. He currently serves as a senior policy counsel for the National Hispanic Media Coalition being raised in Florida. He is aware of the importance of civic engagement and looking Latinx civic potential to ensure that members of the Latinx community are in leadership positions when vital decisions are taken. I want to thank the three of, of them to, uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, let's start the discussion, right? Because you are the ones who are actually working into improving this situation. Arelis, Ben, Martin, for attendees that are not that familiar with the work of uh, your organization, can you please Briefly explain the goals and mission of NEJ, NALIP, 
and NHMC. What kind of programs you have implemented recently? What are the main objectives in terms of advocacy? Let's start with that. Areli. Hi there, Jessica. Thank you so much. Uh, Jessica is also my colleague on the national board with, uh, for the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. But we're an organization that has existed uh, now for more than 35 years to ensure uh, or to promote the fair and accurate representation of Latinos in news, but to also support and, and look for uh, promoting the advancements of Latino journalists in the news industry itself. We are more than intimately familiar with all the issues that Congressman Castro brought up and, and some of the things that we're trying to do, even as we speak, where our organization is going through a strategic planning process, where we're trying to reorient the organization more towards an advocacy and accountability uh, framework that looks to partner with national organizations and build solidarity around these issues. We, you know, our, our founders were, you know, on the vanguard of these types of issues and have been fighting for decades. Uh, for these kinds of things, not just, you know, getting more Latinos in the door uh, of news organizations, but also retaining them, supporting them, and looking to see that they're placed in positions of power where they can shape coverage. Uh, so uh, we can get into the details of specific programs and things that we do, um, but, uh, I, but we can get into that deeper into the conversation. Thank you. Benjamin. Well, um... NALIP, the National Association of Latino Independent Producers, its primary goal is to help accelerate the careers of those folks who are entering the industry, but also solidify the representation of the ones that are at mid-level and upper level. This is uh, Latinos who happen to be in front of the camera, behind the camera, above the line and below the line. For those folks who might not understand those terms, above the line is the writer, producers, directors. We're talking about job creators. You know, the, the folks are actually um, in, in major decisions um, and, and this industries. Our job is to uh, implement this utilizing data-driven uh, strategies, making sure that we're in partnership with the community, but also the studios, the production companies, all the different stakeholders. And the most important thing for us is that now we're utilizing a lot of this data to essentially drive our programming and our specific uh, uh, accelerator and, and incubator programs that can help to hyper-target areas where we're definitely missing from, the, the, from that cultural narrative. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Martin. Yes, uh, good morning, and thank you for having me uh, participate today. My name is Martin Rivera, and I'm the Senior Policy Counsel for the National Hispanic Media Coalition, which is a 35-year-old nonprofit civil rights organization that was founded to eliminate hate, discrimination, and racism towards the Latinx community. We educate and increase Latinx visibility from our policy work in Washington, D.C., to our advocacy work in Hollywood. Um, where we collaborate, uh, create, and connect Latinx talent with, with the entertainment industry. Uh, some of uh, these Latinx pipeline programs that uh, we hold um, include our Latinx Stream Showcase, um, our Series Script Writers Program, um, our Policy and Media Advocacy Fellowships, as well as our Impact uh, Awards Gala, where we recognize Latinx creators, activists, and leaders. Uh, I want this to be more like dialogue, right? So I have some um, ideas uh, that I have in mind. And also I invite attendees to ask their questions because as you've seen, these are the organizations that are actually working to improve this. So the report is pointing out the challenges that we have, but they are actually, uh, they've been around for many years now and, and there's still a lot of work to do, right? So I would like to ask you, um, it doesn't matter the, the order how you uh, answer this, right? So what would you say are the main achievement of your organization throughout these years in terms of promoting major access in Hispanic media industry, whereas it's news or entertainment? I think our, our major achievements at the at the National Association of Hispanic Journalists has largely been opening the door and kicking to try and keep it open for subsequent generations coming through uh, the industry. I think we've been able to give platform and visibility to some of our uh, you know biggest names and stars and being able to uh, leverage their work, their excellent work for advocacy uh, in the industry. One of the things, for example, I'll, I'll offer myself up. I would not be in journalism were it not for pipeline 
online uh, programs like we have at the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and being told that I belonged and, and that this was a an venue for me to express my creativity uh, and to pursue, frankly, my dreams. Uh, and, and I think we do a very good job of that at the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Um, what we're hoping to do and what we're to do more of and to push towards is, is more training to do the kinds of things that uh, Mary Coleman suggested or, or asked about, which is how to start the conversation in your newsrooms in, in terms of advocacy and, and pointing out those flaws as well as uh, supporting journalists once they get into the organization, once they've been there for several years and how they can get into a position where they're actually impacting coverage in a substantive way in the decision-making that takes place. And I think, you know, we've had some successes in, in seeing, um, you know, Latino journalists of all backgrounds being able to rise in the ranks uh, in, in various news organizations. But the idea is that once you're there to be a substantive agent for change uh, in that position, position so that you're not just opening doors, but changing the way and the culture of an organization that see, that might not see Latinos the way you do, or we do. Um, I can go next. Uh, I would say some of um, NHNC's uh, achievements have been uh, developing pipelines for a community to have their voices heard in entertainment, policy, and other leadership positions. Um, as uh, Sherman, uh, uh, as Representative Castro mentioned, um, in media we've seen time and time again how Latinos are portrayed as criminals, drug dealers, or other harmful stereotypes that reinforce the negative attitudes uh, of the Latinx community towards the Latinx community. Um, and this is mainly due to the lack of Latinx representation in front of the camera, behind the camera, and also in leadership positions. Um, and this is despite our population being nearly 20% of the U.S. population. In LA County alone, Latinos make up 48% of the population, yet we hear from industry time and time again that they can't find Latinx talent. That's why our programs are meant to show that our community's talent exists and is in, in abundance. Um, we try to open the doors and provide real world experiences uh, in the entertainment industry. For example, our Latinx showcase is an educational and workforce development program geared towards diverse Latinx creators in front and behind the camera. Um, the show, uh, we showcase directors, actors, writers, directors of photography, and various crew positions. The final product from the showcase consists of six short films that's be that are between five and ten minutes, which are viewed by entertainment executives, streaming services, networks, uh, showrunners, pro production companies, casting directors, managers, agents, and other decision makers in, in, in industry. Um, additionally, our, our series script writers program has helped over 200 uh, Latinx writers uh, achieve careers in the entertainment industry. Um, our screenwriters program consists of an annual uh, writers lab that selects 10 diverse Latinx writers nationwide. And at the end of the program, they, they have uh, developed about a half an hour original series pilot that they will pitch to industry leaders. And several of our writers have actually gone to work on shows on Netflix, CW, NBC Universal, HBO Max, Hulu, Viacom CBS, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, and many more. So one of our greatest achievements has been created that pipeline to show the actual abundance of Latinx talent in the industry. I think for, for us has been uh, really doing the work on the longitudinal basis, uh, restructuring the programs that um, there's a lot of incubators that, that are kind of like one-offs, right? Um, especially targeting the early stage of, of career development for writers, directors, producers, and, and, and sometimes even creative execs. So we have an issue that's beyond pipeline, right? It's, it's some, back in the day, people were arguing whether there was a pipeline at all. There is, but it's very leaky. We're losing our best and brightest uh, to, to essentially other industries and in addition to that, there's really no longitudinal support for their career. Living in Los Angeles and New York is so expensive for a lot of, this is pr the primary places where folks can actually set their careers forward. And it's so cost prohibitive for them to even, even think about raising a family. So what we need to do and that we have been doing effectively as an organization is to make sure that we create the longitudinal support that is not just finding them uh, support for one short film. We need to be there in the trenches. We need to be there with them and making sure that 
their profiles, uh, specifically, you know, their scripts and pilots and everything. They have a platform where they can pitch their projects, right? Time and time again, they got to be able to be recommended. They have to be vetted not just by the agencies, we gotta be able to introduce them. Um, that's another issue on the data side is that the, uh, a lot of the industries, they have their own databases on the way they're essentially bringing in whoever they think should be given the opportunity. What we do as an organization is try to make sure that we present profiles of people. This is diamonds that have been hiding in plain sight, really talented people that they're missing out on. So instead of a, being a very combative situation, what we try to do is introduce them in the friendliest ways possible, introduce most of these carrots to the industry so they can see that this is the type of uh, uh, money that you're leaving on the table. If you don't actually activate these folks that happen to have the formula of understanding the type of projects that can have the, be the, the, the profitable in the box office, they can also be entertaining. And at the same time, they will not be culturally offensive, especially to Latinos and BIPOC at large. So I think by being able to be that essentially creative whisperer for a lot of these Latinos, Nalib has really put itself in the forefront of that conversation. In addition to that, on the data side, our, some of our greatest achievements have been on with the Latino media gap and obviously working with the Annenberg Report to make sure that we're really hyper-targeting. I think it's important to quantify a lot of this information that's coming in and, and be able to compare it. So that way you can set up system of accountability, but we're also talking about the same thing as opposed to what do you mean writers? What type of writers? Are we talking about a, a Afro Latinx writer that happens to be from New York? What does that pipeline look like? Are we having proportional representation of these folks in this industry and so on? So I think from that space, having a longitudinal approach is important and that has been one of our greatest achievements. This is the 23rd year of the organization's history and I hope that at some point, we don't need to be in existence to push the advocacy right. I hope that we get to a point I, I can essentially work myself out of a job and the organization is mostly in existence so they can celebrate Latino excellence as opposed to having to do all this push, push, push to try to get people seen. I, I was uh, about to, to ask you, Ben, uh, about this, because the first, uh, the, the Latino media gap, as you titled, right, the report, that was in 2014, right? Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, when you joined yes. with Columbia University, and it was one of the, uh, my perspective, well-documented, right? Uh, numbers pointing out different areas, including uh, news media as well. So we've been um, almost a decade, right, with this, uh, why we, we cannot advance more? What, what are the challenges? And, and take into account that we are having this discussion in, in a university, right? So what are you as organizational, professional organizations are expecting also from universities that are educating the future talent, right? Well, first of all, as a proud Wildcat <laughs> and former Tucsonan, um, I really uh, understood the principles of, of understanding being on the, on, on the academic side, you really have to understand your data. You really got to be able to dissect it. You got to be able to present what is your thesis about bringing this data forward. So the, the Latino media gap was an incredible achievement. By the way, this is by Dr. Negron Montaner um, out of Colombia. And that specific study, it, it really presented one of the best pictures because before it was it, nobody was demystifying this. People were like, you know what? There's not a lot of Latinos in this space. We're seeing like every 10 years, maybe the Latino wave coming up or Latino explosion, a few names would get you know, awards or maybe recognition and then it would dissipate. So we needed an actual academic to be able to uh, essentially dissect the data and present it forward. And that's what the 2014 Latino Media Gap, which by the way, I encourage everybody to read and all the other studies that came out from USC and UCLA. What's important about that study was that it was one of the first times that we could actually see it section by section, but also there was the analysis of the impact that uh, Congressman Castro uh, covered in his report, in his presentation. The important thing about that is that the, in the absence of narratives of Latinos in TV, film, radio, you name it, not just from the entertainment perspective, from the educational perspective, what happens is that when you have a limited perspective, then the replacement of that perspective happens to be very dangerous. And we saw the wave of, of, of 
polarizing wave against Latinos in that push. The, the, the more Latinos are not on TV, the more these negative portrayals and, and stereotypes and tropes, racial tropes, really took the forefront. Because this industry is driven by profit, obviously. So they're going to always green light TV shows and films that they have seen profitable before. However, this is the chicken. They always will choose the ones that they know that work. So if it's a narco show, guess what? They're going to green light five and another 20, you know, narco shows across the industry because that's what the middle of America, you know, flyover country and all, that's what they're watching. It's entertaining to them. If you actually ask Latinos what they are currently watching, they're watching most of mainstream media, but they also have this hunger to see themselves on television. So I think this report presented something that was really compelling, something that some people, they thought it was like, wow, this is the first time that we've seen this and in a, a very crystallized manner. So building on that report is now allowing us to build the accountability now. Now we're equal playing, but now it's getting so granular that when they present even Latino numbers, we have to figure out, are they US based, US raised, US born? Are you inflating the numbers from Latinos that actually Spaniards that happen to work one Hollywood movie? Are you bringing in Latin Americans to inflate the number to make it seem like, oh, well, wait a minute, you guys got three Oscars. We got the three amigos, Inarritu, Cuaron, and the Toro. They won Oscars already. You guys should be satisfied. The US Latino, you know, the little girl growing up in Old Pascua, right, in Tucson, she's thinking, well, I don't see myself as a director getting that award. I'm not there yet. The pipeline needs to be accelerated. So having those studies, being able to be our guiding North Star is going to make a tremendous difference. Now we're attacking it from multiple sides. And now in conjunction with the other sister organizations, we're now focusing on, on strategies that actually achieve systemic change. And also you named Frances Negron Montaner, but for the audience, attendees that uh, don't know her, she is one of the... Uh, um, inspiring so many of us um, Latina um, scholars in um, the, the, the scholarship, actually uh, the research on media uh, and, and in the Latino perspective. So that, that is also important, having also uh, Latinx uh, educators, right? Pushing also uh, a, a, an interesting perspective uh, within the academic um, discussion. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Uh, Martin, um, um, the National Hispanic uh, Media Coalition has several programs, such as a series of uh, scriptwriters, Latin Extreme Showcase, uh, and Policy Fellowship. I'm particularly interested in that one, because one of the main activities is related to media advocacy and civil rights issues. Uh, what is the organization perspective in terms of protecting media ownership or um, keeping them uh, accountability, right? Accountable. Yes, and thank you, Jessica. Besides our work in Hollywood, NHFC is heavily focused on policy matters on the state and federal level. Our fellowship program provides a unique opportunity for graduate and undergraduate students to advocate on behalf of the Latinx community in telecommunications, media advocacy, and civil rights. On, specifically on the issue of media ownership, we have been engaging the Federal Communications Commission and Congress on this issue since the uh, start of our policy shop over a decade ago. Um, we're active um, in uh, we're active voices in issues regarding mergers and policy conversations. I believe uh, Rep. Castro even mentioned that our president CEO Brenda Castillo was uh, alongside him in some of the conversations in regards to the merger with Time Warner. Um, but we've been also uh, particularly focused on urging the FCC to acknowledge and remedy its history of systemic racism and discrimination. Recently, the NHMC urged the FCC to strengthen rather than relax its media ownership rules and to carefully consider the long lasting effects uh, of its inaction to promote diversity within broadcasts and media ownership. For example, the FCC did, didn't even grant its first license to a non white person until 1956. This is over 20 years after the agency was established. Um, our stance um, was also in response uh, to the uh, commission's fifth report on ownership and broadcast stations, which found that women only held a majority ownership interest in merely 8% of commercial broadcast stations, while Latinx only held 6% of ownership interest. interest. And for non-commercial uh, broadcast stations, women held only a 12% interest, uh, while Latinx only held a 3% interest. So that's why we have seen time and time again, and that we have to... Uh, 
uh, probably have analyzed how these past measures, especially by the commission, such as the FCC, have resulted in discrimination and exclusion and develop a remedial policy solutions to address those long lasting harms. And as uh, Rep. Castro even mentioned, he has a, an amendment uh, that's going to be uh, ruled today in the Rules Committee in regards to creating those uh, pipelines and those studies um, to alleviate discrimination. Um, um, this is interesting because we're having this discussion on entertainment media, news media, so important as well. We, we, we work together, right, into um, contributing uh, into the, the public discourse. In the case of uh, journalist Marelis, the report shows that Hispanic workers have been, uh, have an average of 8% of representation for the newspaper, periodical, book, and directory publisher. How does NHJ perspective uh, perceive this situation? What kind of programs in the organization are in, uh, the organization is implementing to improve these numbers? Uh, and this question is kind of tricky because I'm also participating on the board. So it's like, uh, but I cannot talk about that because I'm hosting the panel, but please uh, inform the, the, the community and our attendees of what NHJ is doing as well. Well, look, I, you know, I could go down a list of things, Jessica, about that the NIHJ done and programs and whatnot. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it just isn't enough, uh, and it's and it's we haven't solved a lot of the structural issues that are at play here. Uh, pay equity being a huge one, particularly for Hispanic women. Uh, barriers to entry that exist for those who want to get into the industry, uh, barriers to entrepreneurship for folks who want to found independent media organizations, not to mention just, uh, well, there's pay, but all these things that we do that we're trying to do in all our different spaces is different media organizations who have Latino or Hispanic in the name, like it's not enough. Right. And I, I'm going to borrow an example uh, from the early part of my life. And this is what absolutely defined sort of what the way that I think about these issues is that I was a college sophomore working for the, the student newspaper at the University of Maryland when I took my first U.S. Latino studies class. And it absolutely blew my freaking mind. Like I could not believe it. Prior to that, I had had no Latino history at any point in my K through 12 education, except for one paragraph about Lolita Lebron and the shooting at the U.S. Capitol in the 1950s. That was it. I had no context for you know, the major fight of, of, of Puerto Rico and its political status. None of that came into being. And so when I went to that first class, it turned something on in my mind as a, as a young kid, right? And that led to, I became part of a movement on campus to bring Latino studies on campus to institutionalize it. It is now a minor and has had like you know hundreds of folks who came through that. But needless to say, what I learned in that experience is that you cannot just make the argument to the institutions or powers that be that the, a moral argument, you should do this because it's the right thing to do. Or even the cynical arguments, you should do this because it's gonna be good for your bottom line, right? Like we have to be the ones that build the coalition around the issue to be able to show the force that like, you don't have a choice, you have to do this. This is a part of who we are. This is a part, This it's not, it's beyond a moral and economic argument. And so when I see like I'm Mr. Rivera and and, and, and Ben here, like I'm, I'm wondering in my head, what are ways that we can collaborate with the NAHJ and others? Like we should have a Latino media like NATO organization, right? Like where we come to each other's defense in these situations that we have each other's back when it comes to fair representation, what, what, and like build on what Congressman Con uh, Castro is talking about right now. And so whatever NAHJ is doing at this point, I can direct you to our website and I'm happy to talk to you offline about those specific things that we do. The fact of the matter is it isn't enough and we're not there yet and we need to get there. You pointed out something very interesting. Uh, the fact that we have um, a program uh, in bilingual journalism here it's a, a direct effect of being an HSI. Uh, for attendees that are not that aware of HSI, and then I know that wasn't planned, Marla, but I wanted to have you jump into the, to the discussion. What is an HSI and what is important to be recognized at that? Yeah, absolutely. So HSI, which stands for Hispanic Serving Institution, is actually a federal designation that comes to colleges and universities by way of the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and it is a designation for colleges and universities that enroll at least 25% undergraduate Hispanic population. 
Um, but really, um, to be an HSI, uh, it is what institutions decide to make of it and what they decide to commit to. Um, and so really here at the University of Arizona, we are committed and, and thankfully with um, the tremendous support from President Robbins, um, you know, to think of this as, as uh, a way that far exceeds meaning and enrollment metric, right? I think many of you have kind of talked about some uh, parallels, right, within your own respective um, industries and areas of expertise. So it's both about access, right, ensuring that the pathways are supported and clear so that our Hispanic Latinx student population um, can enter higher education. But it doesn't stop there, right? Um, comparably, um, what does the organizational culture and the campus culture feel like? Do students step on our campus and get to see um, faculty um, that look like uh, Dr. Rites, right? Are they bringing in um, aspects of their own identity to frame learning experiences that happen both in and outside of the classroom, right? Are they seeing faculty representation, staff and administrator representation? Um, and also too, what are we doing intentionally to ensure that students also reach their goals and aspirations of degree attainment and workforce readiness, right? In ways that are of value to them, their families and their communities and done with an equity lens um, and a culturally relevant approach. So these are the things that we really take to heart here at the University of Arizona. And this bilingual journalism program, I mean, I have to say it's just a tremendous asset of, of graduate curricular offerings at the University of Arizona that are very distinct and intentional commitments of, of how we want this designation to manifest within our degree offering. So those are you know, just a couple of ways that, that all of this conversation really connects and hits home to our HSI designation. Thank you, Marla. And also, uh, this is why I'm so um, um, glad that NAJ, NALIP, uh, NHMC are accepted invitation. And this shows the commitment that they have also because the message, you know, we have the report that is uh, pointing out the challenges that we have in the media landscape. Uh, but we're working to to improve this, right? Like Arelis was saying, um, it, it's it's not enough sometimes. Uh, sometimes we, we feel that, oh, we got uh, something, but with still uh, more, more things to do. And then the more we bring the discussion into the general uh, public, right? It's, it's important because I, uh, for me, it's, it's very important when, when I'm in the classroom with my Latino students, but also I absolutely welcome my non-Latino students because they get to know who is Jovita um, Vidal. And then I like, what, how, when, right? And uh, listen, we have had um, Spanish language newspapers for 213 years in the US. Why, how? So this, all this uh, information that prepared them to be a more engaged citizen uh, in issues of uh, equity representation. And I think I really want to see this as a, from a resilience perspective that, okay, what we can do to do things better, right? And. Um, in that sense, I would like to, to, to ask you, uh, um, the three of you, what are, what are the main challenges, right? If you can point out the main challenges that you have uh, for your organization, for uh, the, the future, the near future to come. I would say that one of the main challenges that we faced at NHMC, especially dealing with the entertainment industry, is getting, um, getting over those negative, outdated stereotypes to show our unique stories, cultures, and customs. And I mean our stories of love, friendship, and familia that have been historically overlooked. And while recently we've had, a, we've had some progress uh, with films like Coco and Canto and The Heights and um, programs such as Hentified, um, a, a Diary of a Future President, or even having fictional ca uh, characters, heroes like Miles Morales, uh, we still do lack that adequate representation in the media industry. And, Part of that is um, that lack of representation in the media industry is partially um, hurts the perception of the of the Latinx community, especially because uh, generally most people think that Latinos are a monolith, monolith group, but we all have our own stories due to our unique cultures, perspectives given perspectives given geographical or generational nuances. But additionally, we also have to focus on leadership positions. 
Um, I believe the GAO report uh, found uh, that only 4% of senior and executive management are Hispanic. And um, that's completely unacceptable uh, given the amount of the Latinx population. Again, in the US, the total population is tw on nearly 20%. And in, L in LA County, where Hollywood basically, it's 50% and they still don't adequately represent our, our community. Um, and in fact, there was a 2016 study by El Rey that has showed that having diverse showrunners led to uh, diverse cast and crew, which show that diversity can have a trickle down effect in media. Therefore, we must ensure that these leadership positions also have adequate Latinx rep representation, because after all, who is better to speak for and promote Latinx issues that impact our everyday lives than members of our own community. Uh, Jessica, in terms of what the, the, the major challenges, I think in general, it's two things, it's isolation and exclusion uh, and isolation in that it's isolation of effort. Uh, generally, right? It's it's the the fact that so many of us are operating in our silos, in our communities, have maybe not a generalized a sense of what Latinx identity is supposed to be and what Latinx identity is to us. Uh, and so we're demanding inclusiveness at the same time, you know, in some ways in our within our own sort of structures being exclusionary uh, as to what Latino and what Latinx stories are supposed to be or what those communities are supposed to look like. And so you have have, you know, the, the young Afro-Latina in her station in Denver, you know, trying to figure out how she can get more stories about the community that she knows in those and, and not understanding who it is that they need to, you know, talk to about this, where they get the support to be able to, you know, move forward, who to contact within their own organization, and how to have the wherewithal, how to build the wherewithal to be able to advocate on behalf of that kind of representation. Um, and, and, and frankly, like, I, I think we could all, I'm just going to keep harping on this. I think we can all do better, uh, a lot better, uh, in reaching out to people and supporting one another. And there are people who are telling these stories and they're telling them on their own platforms. Tick, sometimes they're telling them on TikTok. Sometimes they're telling them on, you know, YouTube and whatnot that, are, are starting to do the work. So I think, again, ex isolation, exclusion, I'm not entirely sure how uh, you, you, you begin deconstructing those, if you will. I think there's been a lot of progress, but I think it's stalled uh, in part because of these very sort of broad and overarching questions. I think the challenges from our perspective has been um, what everybody has been facing uh, across the just the concept of, are we a monolith? And as we know, we're not a monolith. There is no pan-Latino experience in, in particular. So when it comes to the nuances of like the way we're trying to generate stories for Latinos by Latinos sometimes, there is no consensus. Even though obviously Mexican Americans make up the larger part of the Latino population right in the States, you have all this tribalism that usually happens and it's very difficult for that to essentially get to the screen because there's so already, it is so difficult to try to get a show on the air or even a movie distributed and, and obviously be successful at the box office that it gets into that tribalism when things go wrong right away. The, you know, when elections go wrong, the first thing that we go after is like, why did a Latino rally behind a candidate? When something goes wrong and the, uh, uh, for example, a show, a, a show gets canceled, the number one thing that gets addressed is like, why didn't Latinos come together to watch that specific movie or TV show to support it. When the question that we should be asking instead, this is part of the other challenge, is why is it that across this industry, we're still catching up, not 40 years, it's like 50, 60 years now. We're trying to do granular work, right? And we're trying to, we've seen the uptake of like, oh, this year is maybe 3% more writers. Great. But guess what? We got to be proportional. We're not even yet to, we're not even in, in double digits. And so it's very frustrating. I think that's one of the biggest challenges is maintaining focus, maintaining that steadiness. This is a long term. It's a fast paced marathon. But remember, we're catching up, carrying those rocks on our back from 50 years ago. People are wondering, well, what about Le Desi Lu, you know, the, the Ricardos? Yeah, people are finally watching that movie and they're like, oh, there was a Latino on TV how many years ago? 50, 60, 70 years ago. And now how many, how much progress have we made? Right now you can count with your hands how many Latino shows are gonna be on TV. So that is another one of the challenges. 
And then the third challenge for us has been specifically looking at the investment of actual money, actual resources. We personally look at not just how many overall deals are allocated for showrunners, we're looking at the size of the overall deal. So for example, if you look at the Gloria Calderons, the, the Tanya Sarachos, this is the showrunners. This is the people who are the job creators, specifically in television. When you have those folks getting an overall deal, it's a huge multiplier factor. We need like 20 Tanya Sarachos, 20 Gloria Calderon Kellets for them, for, for them to essentially transform the industry. We're still playing with single digits. In addition to that, if they do get a deal, I think it tops out at maybe 10 to 15 million. And you might say, well, for us, that's a lot of money. But to produce a show, that's nothing. That's, that's, that's basically, you know, crumbs. And so, yeah, we've been now clapping back at, at people who are now clapping for any crumbs that are celebrated. We're not doing that anymore. What we're doing is pushing more because it's like, okay, not only assign more overall deals, multiply the showrunner pipeline just in television, but also make sure that the deals are rich to the level of the Shonda Rhimes and the Ryan Murphys of the world with, we're talking about hundred to $300 million deals. Now that's a game changer. So it's very important for us to keep a, a, a really good track of those achievements. And then finally, here's the, 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 the one challenge that a lot of people forget. The music scene and the way, for example, Encanto, right? The, the, that music, don't, you know, that song, we don't talk about Bruno and the soundtrack by Lee manuel Miranda is pervasive, right? We need to lock in on that. We need to understand where that came from. Behind the scenes, our organization consulted with the Walt Disney Company to make sure, right, specifically in the animation department, are we represented authentically on that screen, even though it's a fantasy world, right? It was supposed to be La Gran Colombia. We wanted to make sure that the, well, how many people of color were actually represented behind the scenes and the families and the animals and the culture, the arepas, you could see the size of the arepas. We were consulting even on that. Like there's the arepa colombiana, arepa venezolana, and all those little details translated to the screen. And now you see little girls singing seeing themselves on TV, little boys singing, and not just Latinos. It's actually dominant culture kids. They're, they're singing those songs, and they're bringing it to their living rooms. The challenge for us is how do we have 100 Encantos so it can become more pervasive? It, it helps that narrative. It helps to lock in the deal. I'm just so loving this message because we are so willing to make things better, right? And and call me romantic, but this is why we do our job uh, because we, we we want to not only um, um, work for the community with the community, we are part of the community, and this is this is important as well, right? So we we bring so all this important discussion into our daily daily uh, work. Um, I think um, you answer some of the questions that we have in the Q&A. Uh, I think you are able to read, right, the questions. Uh, and then the, the, um, the, uh, we have a question that African-Americans have made major strides in mainstream television, including TV commercials and film. What can we learn? Uh, what, what can the Latinx community learn from them to attain similar achievements? Anyone? Could you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Yes, it, it's, uh, it's on the chat. You, I think you're able to, to read the Q&A, right? Uh, it says the African-Americans have made major strides in mainstream television, including TV commercials and film. Uh, what can the Latinx community learn from uh, them to attain similar achievements? I would say is um, hold panels such as this. Uh, the African-American community has been active and they, especially uh, I've seen here in Washington DC where, where I'm based, how the Congressional Black Caucus fights for their community when it comes to media or any advocacy issues. I feel that the Latino community is realizing the lack of representation in all, all forms of uh, either me media, uh, civil rights movements. And now we're finally having, we finally have our leaders have uh, positions of power, such as Representative Castro. Uh, I know I'm coming from Florida and being uh, Puerto Rican, uh, my former member of Congress, Congressman Darren Soto, he was the first member of Boricua from Florida, which is surprising. But having those representation in uh, 
in policy positions, but also having that representation in uh, leadership positions such as screenwriters, showrunners, um, is what is going to make that difference. And having, again, panels such as this, informing our community um, of the things that we can do to actually make the change, not just in policy, but also in entertainment, is what's required of us uh, going forward. So we are um, arriving to the end of the panel. Uh, I would like to thank Arelis Hernandez from NEJ, Benjamin Lopez from NALIP, Martin Rivera for NHMC for accepting our invitation to participate in this event and help us examine the underrepresentation of Latinx in media industry. Now I would like to give the floor, well, the screen, <laughs> to uh, Dr. Judy Marquez Kiyama, Associate by Propos of Faculty Development within the Office of Faculty Affairs at the University of Arizona, who implements the efforts to further the aims to the University of Arizona to excel in its Hispanic service institution designation uh, through increasing institutional capacity among faculty. Thank you, Dr. Retis. Um, as we move to close out this outstanding session, I'd like to begin by offering appreciation, of course, to Congressman Castro for his leadership, his time and insight on, all, on this critical topic. Um, our speakers today from President Robbins uh, to Dr. Franco, to all of our panelists, um, Arelis Hernandez, Benjamin Lopez, Martin Rivera, have been exceptional. I especially want to recognize Dr. Jessica Retis for her vision in organizing today's session and her vision in implementing the bilingual journalism program here at the University of Arizona. Thank you all. I want to also take a moment to capture and reemphasize some of the key points that we've heard today. Um, in particular, the attention that has been brought to the lack of Hispanic and Latinx representation in media is central to our understanding of and responsibility as a Hispanic serving institution. And this is part of what Dr. Franco talked about. The connection between post-secondary institutions and workforce development is clear. As an HSI, it is imperative that this connection is understood and carried out within the context of our local and regional Latinx communities and our borderland proximity. Likewise, as an HSI, we have to consider how educational opportunities are shaped for Latinx students. The ways in which the pathways are constructed into undergraduate and graduate degree programs for Latinx students who are interested in journalism and media careers matters. This is not a time for post-secondary institutions and especially for HSIs to be passive about educational pathways for Latinx students. This is a matter of responsibility for administration, for faculty, for staff, and for students. And as we have heard, we have to consider the influence on workforce development. We must also consider access and equity implications. As noted, this includes access to programs whereby students can prepare for a career in bilingual journalism, media production, writing, film, television, and publishing, and access to hiring and, and those positions that are already in place and cultural inclusion, right, and support with respect to the opportunities that professionals have within media and equitable treatment once in those roles. We know then that this also increases access for Latinx and Spanish speaking communities to see and hear themselves represented and represented positively um, in those stories that are shared and the ways in which those, short, those stories are told. This has implications for access around civic engagement and the ways in which Latinx communities understand possibilities for democratic participation. Ultimately, this is about cultivating access for our current and future Latinx generations. And so we call folks together in coalition, in collectivism, and look at the possibilities when we collectively work across sectors, across education, across media, policy and public service, and so many more to uphold our responsibilities for increasing representation. Thank you. It just occurred to me, uh, it wasn't discussed with my panelists and, uh, and um, partners in, in this panel, but we could try to make this an annual get together where we could, you know, annually have a, you know, a test. We're in a university, right? Let's do a test. What, what has been done? And when, uh, let, let's check that. I really, really appreciate uh, yeah, you making the time to meet with us. I want to give the screen to Dr. Marla Franco, who uh, accepts to partner with us and then uh, to close this uh, event. Thank you so much, Marla. 
Yes, uh, thank you again to all of our panelists and uh, commentators. It has just been um, a really riveting conversation. Um, I really uh, appreciate the, the intersection of who's represented at the table. Um, thank you to our, our leaders within media, um, our educators within higher education, and certainly Congressman Castro for providing um, that policy-oriented perspective. Um, and as um, one of our colleagues mentioned, right, this, this, is, this is wonderful. This is a great conversation. Um, I think we're all respectively, you know, wanting to do more work, but it's it's simply not enough, right? We are grateful to have this new master's in bilingual journalism program with Dr. Oretes at the table. The sky is the limit in terms of where that program can go. Um, excitedly, she is recruiting the second cohort for that program, so I encourage people to apply. We're trying to make things happen here at the University of Arizona. We're committed as a Hispanic serving institution to this and, and supporting her and her, her vision for this program. We want to be part of the solution, right? And this solution is connecting uh, higher education institutions, particularly HSIs, with media industry and certainly connecting it to uh, the policy level. Um, so I just encourage you to stay engaged, not just in the conversation, but in solution finding, right? Um, and, and certainly follow, follow the program. We look forward to engaging others in support, continued support of the program. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, joining us today and for everyone for being a part of this wonderful program. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you everyone for attending the panel um, and see you hopefully next year. <laughs> Thank you so much.